Well, good morning. Um, we have uh, today two keynote speakers, one from uh, Valencia, one from Lisbon. Uh, we are going to start with uh, Professor Javier Poyatos. He's from uh, the, University, the Polytechnic University of uh, Valencia. Uh, his presentation will be about form and meaning in architecture and urbanism, principles of quality. Um, he's a PhD architect, uh, professor and coordinator for theory of architecture at the University Polytechnic of Valencia. He is director of the Department of Architectural Composition uh, at the Polytechnic University of Valencia also. He has been secretary uh, and deputy di uh, director of the Department of Architectural Composition, also in uh, University Polytechnic of Valencia, and Deputy Director of Quality and Deputy Director of Culture, Quality and Image um, uh, de la Escuela Politécnica Superior de Alcoy, uh, also in Valencia. He leads the research team Innovation and ex eh, Excelencia en la Configuración de los Entornos Humanos, Innovation and Excellence in um, Human uh, uh, Urban Environments um, of the Department of Architectural Composition, also in Valencia, Universidad Politécnica. And he has organized several uh, international symposiums and seminars related to architecture. He has uh, publications on theory and criticism of architecture and the city. Uh, and uh, he also designed um, some uh, reference buildings as the office of um, Banesto Bank and commercial gallery uh, Georges Rouen, both in Valencia. Uh, I really would like to thank, in the name of the organization, for you to be here, and later on for uh, Professor Beron also. Um, as you already know, there will be a um, 40 minutes session uh, after uh, Professor Beron with another 40 minutes, and then 20 minutes for discussion. I hope you all have uh, questions for the discussion session. Uh, regarding um, Professor Javier Poyatos, he will do his presentation in English, but uh, during the discussion, uh, I will translate his uh, answers towards your questions because you will answer in uh, Spanish and then I will translate to uh, English, okay? But he, he understands English, uh, so I don't have to translate your questions, I just translate your, his answers, okay? So once again, thank you and be my guest. Thank you. Excuse uh, my English. Thank you for uh, inviting me <coughs> to this interesting uh, symposium. I feel very honored to speak about uh, architectural form in this beautiful and significant city of Oporto. I would like to reflect on the understanding and experience of form with you. Let's understand form as the exterior sensitive presence of a reality. Then we can speak about form in architecture and urbanism. Aristotle, in his work Metaphysics, distinguished form in natural elements from form in works of art. In works of art, form exists in the human soul before becoming material. Things, words, form in the soul are developed artificially, affirms the Greek philosopher. Form for Aristotle, according to Erwin Panofsky, implies in some way Plato idea. Ignacio Gardela expressed once during his brilliant architectural career. Here I understood that form rises out of idea more than of action, that we must speak of form idea more than for faction. End of quote. From his viewpoint, Alberto Campo Baeza understands architecture as constructed idea. 
The fourth form in works of art and in architecture is invented in the soul of the creator. But architectural form shall have a consistent meaning. The meaning of an architectural form shall be its correct adaptation to the objective of human habitat, according to the corresponding uses in each case, whether a home, a museum, or a temple. This should be the primary meaning that the architect looks for, the raison d'etre of the architectural work, its ontological meaning. Forms should then reach a dimension of benefit of being, good for something. Form has to be good for inhabiting in the, case, uh, in the case of architecture. In this way, form grows out of the author's intention that gives in part of the meaning. The author's intention can also include research construction with custom request, or may not include essays and still be satisfactory. It can also include many more aspects in addition to a strict function. The architect's idea can be very wide-ranging. There is not only one architectural response to the program of use in a building. We find ourselves before the creative dimension of the architects that develops intelligence, intuition, sensitivity, even art in an open and uh, impredictable form, imagination, dreams, the subconscious, etc. The creation will be even more unpredictable in the author is a genius. Each architect has its own intimate significance. The architect's specific vital and vital energy and creative flair must be recognized using the expression by Emmanuel Munier. That is to say, we have to consider the architect's personal response to provocation from the cultural environment and from history. In short, as Ortega y Gasset said, we must observe how the architect takes on his circumstances and gives specific meaning to his architectural forms. The methods the methods of form design in architecture can never be completely systematic or scientific in the normal sense of the scientific term. There is an unpredictability in the invented form that comes from the free creativity of the author and complicates definitive systematization of form. Perhaps we are moving to the play into the world of ideas and things, but not the play enough into the inquiry of the human condition. On the other hand, the creator's concept does not drain the understanding of architecture and its significance. As Hans-Georg Gadamer, and contemporary hermeneutics have clearly indicated. The understanding <coughs> and enjoyment of a building does of a building does <coughs> not end <coughs> with the intention excuse me <coughs> Okay. <clears throat> Intention of the creating architect. The building communicates aspects to the inhabitant that were not necessarily foreseen by the architect. 
Form does not derive from faction as its normality understood by the reductionist vein since the modern movement. <clears throat> the eminent psychologist and art uh, theorist Rudolf Harheim <clears throat> has admirably discussed this for us in his work, the dynamics of architectural form. For example, ancient classic decorum refers to what a building needs to be an appropriate exercise of usage, including the decoration and symbolic dimension. <clears throat> Arheim has basically summed up several aspects of form that can communicate. Uh, quote, we ask ourselves if such a building really presents the necessity unity to be visually understood. We ask ourselves if this exterior aspect reveals the physical and psychological function for which it was created, if it reflects the spirit that inspired it or soul if it inspired the community, if this at least the partial expression of the base of the intelligence and imagination of man. Human spirit has the ability to perceive the expressive and symbolic value of forms, and the architectural develop a special sensitivity and intention for this expressive value of forms. In any case, this search quality architectural form is very relevant. The values of quality and excellence that come to us from the ancient Greek civilization must be recovered. <clears throat> quality exists when form successfully organizes a human situation physically and spatially. When it generates objective and subjective satisfaction in the user, physical and spiritual satisfaction, we should look into the universal basic of human perception that Arheim indicates. Studies based on shared species of quality are needed. We have to investigate the perception of the positive values of the expression of form, studies that are contrasted and even agreed upon among interesting specialists that work on architectural form, studies on public reaction towards these positive values of expression of form must also be done. The condition, the condition that Leon Battista Alberti established for architectural harmony will always be a good for the perception of quality at form, such continuity that nothing can be added, taken away, or modified without damage. Now, I would like to focus on urban form, urban form uh, only. It is, com it is common to verify the loss of quality in urban form during the, the 20 and 21st centuries, especially in the current globalization scenario, and in comparison to previous century. On the contrary, in the Historic city, especially in the heritage city, we can frequently appreciate a, a noticeable quality of urban form. Rudolf Arheim has eloquently written about this current situation. We observe on, on mistakeable things of weariness, lack of discipline, and responsibility. The design of many buildings, furniture, and garments is an example of this decadence. The most uh, disgusting symptoms are translated into an extravagance without limits, vulgar tastes, and to trivial thoughts. We are too prone to accept little and to abandon the definitive effort without taking advantage of all the resources 
and to ignore what used to be <coughs> the conditional sine qua non for worthy art. This insufficiently is reflected in the low quality of most of the works and in and the lack of valid criteria for their approval in the mass media." End quote. End of quote. On the contrary, the accuracy of values of quality is the role of architectural and urban criticism in their respective areas. The eminent Spanish theorist and art historian Enrique La Fuente Ferrari said, in general terms, criticism is a subtle on mysterious ability to perceive the most intimate and valuable qualities in things, people, or artworks. These qualities are sometimes apparent and sometimes even, even within a whirlpool of secondary and superfluous flops. This perception of quality, this distinction between the secondary and the essential, is for me the most eminent uh, critical ability. And indeed, it is not only applicable to work of art, and uh, of what. Methodology. The quality of human uh, uh, of urban form developed in the past from a sort of good sense and collective taste, slowly and deliberately preserved, must nowadays be achieved in a conscious and refined way. The collective taste in urban form is not the same anymore due to lack of sensitivity. An accelerated pace in urban transformation, the priority of economy profits, etc. We must then develop disciplinary training in this area. Therefore, the research in <coughs> and in identification of features uh, of quality in urban form is relevant in order to have the corrective tools available in the face of this contemporary cultural loss. For this reason, the identification of these parameters of quality from a hermeneutic point of view is proposed. That is, principles capable of opening a certain horizon of understanding and enjoyment of a specific quality perspective and also horizon of conscious creation. It is understood here that quality in urban form is always connected to the user and to urban life. Form has quality only when it is valuable functionality and aesthetically to the integrated experience of the user. Fitly, as we said, attention must be paid to the splendid achievement in urban form in the past, analyzing the diverse principles with <coughs> produce that quality. This way we will understand and better value the city of the past. The story of architectural theory can help us in this sense by means of the principles that appear in many uh, treatises and essays. These principles are cornerstone on good practice. and have greatly influenced the practice of architecture and urbanism during those historical periods. This is the way that principles should as beauty, decorum, grace, decoration, taste, etc. appear. Then it is possible to look at the treatise by Vitruvius, Alberti, or Palladio, but also the essays from the 18th and 19th centuries. This way we will be conceptually improving our critical vision of the past. Both urban form of the past and the historical treatises and essays present a combination of very valuable principles that should be expanding along with other contemporary principles of quality extracted from the phenomenological and psychological experience of the city. If we go in depth info analysis and meditation, as Ortega and Gasset said, of those principles of quality in urban form, beauty, elegance, decorum, etc., 
we, we can in, infer that they also open other several diverse ways in the process of obtaining quality. We can call them uh, sub-principles of quality. For instance, beauty is not singularly unique. On the contrary, it offers a wide range of distinguishable options such as harmony, elegance, delicacy, refinement, technical perfection, etc. Therefore, each of these aspects constitutes a sub-principle of Beatle. Now we are going to provide two testimonies that support the need for qualitative, qualitative detailing of the direction that we are developing. Anon Han Rudolf Argen states, the qualities that can be human values can be described with considerable accuracy, but many of these descriptions cannot be, cannot be quantitatively verified by means of measurements or recounting data. They shared this trait with many other facts of the spirit and nature, and it does not prevent them from existing or being important. However, from his viewpoint, Ernst Gombrich confirmed this idea. On this is what critics did in the ancient times and what they have been doing ever since, that is to analyze and to should divide ideas for its admiration and to articulate the multiplicity of human experience within the canon. And note and quote the Gombrich of Gombrich. The understanding of principles and subprincipes of quality in urban form is needed even more in order to verify real historical or current cases of urban excellence. It is necessary to study specific urban examples that demonstrated an adoptable quality in form. It is possible in this way to create a catalog of typological concreteness of form supported with cases from the principles and sub-principles of quality that have been analyzed. In, addi in addition, a better understanding and evaluation of the city on the past and uh, that of today sack as a critical profile of principles of excellence can contribute to overcome the poor quality of form in the contemporary city with new conceptual resources for projects. In this way, each principle offers a horizon of understanding and also of urban creativity. The principles and sub-principles in turn can intersect, offering a cumulative and transverse quality option. Therefore, what this paper hopes to offer is a relevant and structural hermeneutical tool for the analysis of urban form uh, through its values of quality and excellence. This method is related to classical research of urban form. An example is the one performed by Gordon Cullen in the concise landscape or that of Christopher Alexander in a pater language. These studies try to, to determine certain principles or concepts of form and their explanation with examples. The, different, the difference with these more general works is that here, in this present, presentation, uh, the goal of these principles is to capture directly and specifically the aspects of quality in urban form. The principles or con concepts are in turn ideal for use 
as keywords to consciously channel creativity in urban design. We would like to initially set for six principles of quality in urban four without attempting to be exhaustive and present them for critical contrast by other possibly interested authors, together with a real city case story. Each principle contributes a type of value that is beneficial in terms of four. Beauty. Using Thomas Aquinas' definition, pulcrum es quod visum placet, we will define a beauty as that which is pleasing to contemplation by the spirit. Philosophy and aesthetic authors have documented many variants of beauty or uh, sub-principles as we have called them here. The aesthetics expert Tatarkiewicz says, there have been numerous attempts at listing these varieties of beauty. An exceptional full listing is found in Goethe. Among other names, such variety as uh, varieties uh, of uh, beauty, profundity, invention, plasticity, sublimity, individuality, spirituality, nobility, sensitivity, taste, aptness, suitability, potency, elegance, cold lines, completeness, ringness, warmth, charm, grace, glamour, skill, lightness, vitality, delicacy, splendor, sophistication, Stylishness, rhythmicity, harmony, purity, correctness, elegance, perfection. Uh, this is an ample list, but it is hardly an exhaustive one, if only because it passes over dignity, distinctiveness, monumentally luxuriance, poetry, and naturalness. End of quote of Tatarkevich. Another principle, scale. Scale, grace, pleasantness, decorum, identity. And sub principles. principle of scale. Scale is the right size of urban form in relation to the inhabitants or users. So that is generated a sensation of functional and psychological comfort. Therefore, with the right scale, buildings and urban space can contribute to a sensation of welcome and sensitive dimensioning for citizens. Grace. Grace is the cordial and agreeable aspect of urban form. Pleasantness. Pleasantness is the assorted and stimulating aspect of urban form. Decorum. This is the way urban form adapts to different purposes and social significances. Identity. Identity is the connection between urban form and the identifying values of the community where it is located. Now we are going to address the sub-principles of beauty, only uh, beauty in urban form. That is the multiple varieties of beauty present in urban form. The principle, the principle of beauty is that which possesses the largest quantity and diversity of sub-principles. 
Therefore, we will study it in detail and with a special dedication in this presentation. Beauty understood as the quality uh, that pleases the spirit in the most uh, outstanding principle of quality. Consequently, it requires preferential attention due to this richness, attention that beauty has received through good story. Some relevant sub-principles of beauty will be explained now in uh, a general way. Harmony in buildings. Here we refer to a classical expression in beauty. It is the cohesion of diversity, based in some cases on relations of mathematical proportions, and in others it's uh, simply inspired by taste alone. Harmony with the natural environment. The city is integrated aptly and pleasantly with its surrounding natural environment. Appropriate presence of nature inside urban form. Here we refer to parks, gardens, fountains, etc. Qualified in different ways in the urban landscape. Chromatis for well-being. Its goal is the citizen's happiness, achieved through the strong emotional value of color. Efficient sequence of spires and forms. The perception of urban beauty is not only static, but also dynamic, since the citizen moves through successive areas of the city. A complex essentially. Mere essentially is not enough for beauty. Essentially must be uh, commendable. Perceptual clearness. This affects the sense pristinely and immediately. It also refers to sheer geometries and to prime colors. This pure beautiful by praised by Plato. Cheerful clarity. This concept does not only refer to simply luminous clarity, but also the perceptual clarity stimulated by visual delight. Read and musicality. These qualities lend fascination and energy to form. Light designs, the play of lights and shadow, uh, dimmed light and soft shadow, created atmospheres in the city at different times of day. Manifest, manifestation of life, the communication of life through form is perceptually invigorating and transmits existential vigor as a vehicle of beauty. Useful eloquent force. This refers to power and intense and admirable communication. Serenity of form. It is pleasing to be spirit, according to the taste of ancient Greeks. Polite delicacy. This rep eh, excuse me. The delicacy and courtesy are in themselves pleasing to the spirit. Qualified refinement. This represents the design of the refined and the exquisite. Elegance. Elegance in itself is a, always a vehicle of beauty. Humble charm. This is another vehicle of beauty and it is a characteristic of Zen aesthetics.
one of four. This represent the abundance and qualified variety of diverse forms or the appropriate presence of decoration. Freedom and flexibility of form. Freedom and flexibility make force natural and commendable. Graceful lightness. It is a source of charm. The masterful curve. The curve has emotional repercussions and undoubtedly in place preserved with it is skillfully executed. Qualified textures. These are a source of interesting sensorial and psychological communication. Technical perfection in construction. This conveys evidence of good implementation and the corresponding experiential satisfaction. Conclusion. Our final goal in this paper is to address quality in urban form, not through superficial intuitive attitudes, but from conceptually structured intuition based on shared experience of quality. In this way, a new conceptual perspective of research is opening and offered to other researchers who, who are looking to achieve certain critical consensus so needed today in order to comfort a higher quality of form in contemporary cities. Thank you for your attention. Yesterday I said when uh, Professor Gonzalo Henriques uh, closes presentation that I said uh, that he was part and he will be part of this symposium. Uh, I can say the same from Professor uh, Beirão. He's with us from the beginning and is always available to be with us. So we really thank you for your time to be with us and for um, do this path with us also. Um, I will introduce Professor uh, Beirão right now. He, he has a degree in um, architecture uh, from the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Lisbon. He worked in several architecture offices between uh, 1988 and 1993. In 1998, he founded the architecture firm uh, B Quadrado Architects together with Miguel Braz. He has a master in urban design uh, at uh, ISCTE, uh, Lisbon Institute University, and a PhD in urban design and computation uh, at uh, TU Delft, Netherlands. In 2012, um, the theme of his uh, dissertation um, is the development of design patterns for um, developing computational uh, tools for urban design. In his thesis, City Maker, Design for Urban Design Grammars, the anagram SIM uh, stands for City Information Modeling, stressing the emphasis of information support in urban design. His current research interests focus on the use of parametric systems and a geographic database to investigate the following topics, measuring parameters of urbanity and morphological studies, development uh, of urban design evolutionary systems, uh, customize, uh, customizable uh, systems for social housing, including uh, actions uh, at urban plan level, uh, developing strategies for the Portuguese dispersed territories, future housing, uh, game-based participatory systems, urban analysis, and his um, presentation will be Urban Challenge for Regions to uh, Streets. I really thank you again for you being here. Thank you. I think that after the presentation of Professor uh, Javier, um, this will be a natural um, continuation from what was presented here before and your work that also focused. One of the things that we said yesterday is about the relation between uh, quality, creativity, 
and formalization or uh, computation. Thank you again, and to my guest. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Javier, for your excellent presentation. Um, so I'm going to um, first start my presentation f uh, for showing um, uh, some challenges that we have to face nowadays uh, throughout the world. Uh, I will not concentrate specifically on uh, the Portuguese situation, but on things that we find uh, throughout the world. And my idea of focusing on an international level is because tools are not uh, focusing on a particular place. They are, should be ap applicable everywhere. Um, so uh, I will start uh, by showing what are these challenges. I will go very fast through that uh, so that I can focus on a few examples of work that we developed uh, at different scales. So I'll start from the regional scale and go uh, towards the street scale, uh, so at different levels of, uh, uh, of understanding. Uh, so what are these uh, uh, contemporary challenges? Uh, we nowadays have different uh, uh, paradigms. Uh, uh, the um, territory, territories are changing on a global level. Um, we have extreme economic uh, pressure, uh, real estate speculation, um, a lot of problems between uh, wealth and, and poverty. Most of the dynamics of uh, uh, countries, especially developing uh, countries, are based on uh, this tension between wealth and, po and poverty. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, population growth brings us a consciousness uh, on ecological and, and sustainable uh, goals. So the ideas of producing green cities, sustainable cities, smart cities are uh, at, at the moment uh, uh, main focus. And also the fact that we have different types of social, uh, cultural, regional problems uh, um, on uh, the, the different uh, parts of, of the world. So uh, Asia, Africa, uh, America, and, and Europe have totally different uh, uh, contexts. Um, I'm also going to look at this uh, on the perspective of uh, the consequences of information technology, uh, what the digital uh, revolution means, uh, essentially the fact that uh, we now live in a global world where we have information about uh, almost everything uh, and, uh, and we can use that data. Uh, we have real-time data, we, we have uh, data about almost everything, um, but also uh, the fact that uh, we've connected with uh, part of uh, a single world. Um, so now I'm going to show a little bit what's happening, just to show the differences on uh, what's happening in the different parts of the world. So uh, what we can see in North America is basically uh, problems related with sprawl repair, because they produced a lot of uh, sprawl in their cities uh, throughout the modern uh, eras. and. Um, they also have shrinking cities. Um, the problems are usually related with low-dense uh, territories. The high density only occurs on city centers uh, where there is a lot of uh, uh, economic uh, pressure and most of the growth is essentially planned. So the fact that things are planned, they can have some degree of control over the situations. These are examples taken from Detroit. And this is the type of urban sprawl that we find um, uh, in, in America. In South America, we have fast growth, uh, a lot of unplanned situations, also fast growth with planned situations, uh, high density in most of the situations, especially in the unplanned, uh, a lot of economic pressure for the uh, uh, planned situations, there's also some need for uh, sprawl repair uh, in uh, uh, the outside areas uh, where there's still some low density. These are the type of images that we find related with these problems. Uh, so basically two opposite situations. 
and the mix of the two. This is actually in Sao Paulo. In Africa, I would say we have uh, even more intense uh, uh, problem of the same kind, especially fast growth and planned, uh, where we can find both uh, uh, high density and low density. I will, I will show that. There's a, a lot of sprawl. Um, and there's some planned uh, 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 developments uh, very much related with uh, uh, economic pressure. Uh, but the, basically, the most extensive image that we find in Africa are images of this kind. Some t what I call the sprawl is on the outskirts we find this. And it's essentially large extensions of this type of urban environment with this type of problems. And the next picture is one of the most uh, incredible pictures about the spread of rubbish throughout our cities. This is in Cairo. It's basically a disgusting image. Uh, and in Asia, we have uh, two phenomena uh, simultaneously. We have more or less the same type of uh, uh, thing that we find in, in Africa. I will show some images of that. But we also have the opposite of the extreme uh, uh, wealthy developments, uh, essentially the examples that we find from China and, 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 for instance, Singapore also, where we can find images like this based on extreme economic pressure. Uh, the city form in China is changing into large areas of things like this. It's a curious pattern that we find essentially in, in, in China. But we also have these two types of environment still uh, um, living together, things like this. And this craziness about the, the uh, economic wealth uh, that we find, for instance, in the case of uh, Singapore. This is, this is an image from Singapore. Um, and then we also have the other types of, uh, uh, let's say, unplanned uh, fast growth, uh, especially in India, Bangladesh, we find images like this. This one is uh, from uh, um, Mumbai, and again from Mumbai. Mumbai is the, one of the most dense cities in the world. In Europe, we have uh, totally different types of uh, problems. We have uh, essentially uh, historical cores needing uh, uh, urban rehabilitation, but they're also under uh, extreme economic pressure. Uh, so it, it becomes a difficult uh, uh, task, uh, but there's this idea of uh, a, a very important heritage that needs to be uh, preserved. Um, we also have uh, shrinking cities and the need for sprawl repair, extreme dispersed territories. Um, these are images that we can find in Europe. Um, and I have, regarding dispersion, I have two images taken from Portugal, where we have this kind of uh, disper dispersion of the territory. Very low density, uh, uh, very uh, um, extended uh, network uh, of of houses uh, on a territory that loses its agricultural uh, functionality and is not ex exactly urban, uh, um, let's say, a town or a city as we know it, although it's urbanized territory. So uh, what tools and what methods can we use to uh, deal with this uh, type uh, of problems? 
Um, I've been working on the concept of city information modeling, which is basically connecting information and, uh, um, and dealing with that information, generating plans and uh, uh, simulating uh, 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 ideas or solutions, calculating indicators in, in, in real time. Uh, one of the most difficult problems is to find the right indicators to actually deal uh, uh, with the problems. And, um, but the idea is to uh, inform the designer about the consequences of, uh, uh, of their acts uh, um, in a way that uh, they can uh, further support their, their decisions. So mainly the idea is to base everything on a, uh, a database, which is this uh, 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 central element, uh, connected with the GIS uh, environment, uh, with a design interface, uh, which I basically use uh, uh, a CAD plus a, a visual programming interface to uh, develop the simulations. Uh, we have some uh, uh, measurements and calculations done in real time, and uh, we also run some statistics uh, analysis to, uh, um, to evaluate uh, uh, certain situations. Basically, the software that we're connecting uh, is given here. Uh, I usually show first the diagram because the diagram gives the conceptual uh, approach. Uh, and this is the software that we've been using, essentially because most of the software that you see here is, uh, uh, um, is uh, uh, um, open source software, so it allows us to uh, develop further and uh, share information with other, uh, uh, with other researchers. So basically, the, the tools for developing urban plans have these properties, they are uh, uh, generative and parametric. Uh, the urban analysis tools are based on geographic information uh, systems. Uh, they uh, imply uh, data management and mapping and also the use of statistics for analysis. And uh, uh, for public space uh, uh, analysis, we developed recently uh, um, a 3D uh, type of informed, uh, um, of uh, 3D informed representations of public space, which we call convex and solid voids, and I'm going to show a presentation on the topic. Just to give some credits to uh, things that are related with this work. Um, so everything started with a project called uh, uh, City Induction, from which my uh, um, uh, PhD uh, research came out, which is called uh, City Maker. Uh, you can find it on uh, the TU Delft rep repository if you want to find it. But the uh, city induction project was uh, coordinated by uh, Professor Zedward, and it involved myself and two other researchers, Nuno Montenegro and George Gil. So we together developed uh, sets of tools that uh, we're now working using together. Um, I was at the moment more focused on uh, the generative uh, um, tools, but uh, nowadays I'm actually focusing on the integration of this and more concentrated on analysis rather than uh, uh, the other uh, elements. Um, and I also have to quote uh, uh, Piruz Nurian and uh, Pedro Hobos because they, they actually contributed directly to uh, uh, the work that uh, I developed. And I also have to mention um, uh, Rudy Stoofs. He was also my supervisor in, uh, in Delft. And uh, also Henko Beckering and Seville Savildis, who also did some supervision. And so what type of problems uh, uh, am I going to, to show? Um, um, Basically, uh, um, I'm going to show, I, I will start by the large scale project, which is this uh, uh, project on Turino. Uh, I will sh then show uh, uh, a project on the automatic classification of urban typologies. And uh, then I will show this one, the effects of a territorial uh, depth on 
uh, the on street liveliness. So uh, the Torino project uh, ended up in a, a workshop. This was the main idea at a certain point was to develop a, a workshop based on the region of, uh, uh, of Piemont, but uh, um, it actually took one year of and a half work before we developed uh, uh, the workshop, and everything came from uh, uh, a team based on uh, uh, a set of Italian researchers, Eugenio Giacchino and Marta Colombo, and two of my PhD students, Stefano Fiorito and uh, Francesco Orsi. And we started working uh, with them on a, a topic that was approached to us uh, through uh, uh, Fondazione de, dell'Ordine de, degli Architetti uh, from Turino, and also from the commune of uh, Bottigliera Alta. And um, they basically gave us, uh, uh, um, as a starting point, uh, a challenge. Two, two requests. One came from Bottigliera Alta to help them understand uh, what their municipality is more suitable for. And this was a very abstract question. And second, from Kof Industria, which is a, 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 an industrial association of stakeholders from the region of Piemonte. Uh, they, want, they also uh, wanted to know um, how they could uh, help their associates to develop their businesses and basically tell them where they should do their best investment. Again, this is a very, very abstract uh, uh, question. And the thing uh, on um, uh, urban planning in, in Italy is that um, well, and this is more or less common in, in most countries, is that uh, even though uh, they might have some growth uh, strategies and some urban planning, there is not really much uh, connection with the real uh, uh, estate uh, pressure and with uh, uh, the economic pressure. Uh, because they don't, their investments are not compatible with the time that the bureaucracy takes to uh, give a response to, to their problems. Also, the problems are complex, and, and they don't find uh, uh, easy answers to, uh, uh, to know exactly where to do or to conduct uh, uh, their uh, investments in the best way. Um, so... Uh, the idea here was to try to find a methodology that would help uh, enhance growth and development. So we developed a methodology based on a, a scenario-based approach. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, the Italian um, uh, uh, growth uh, strategies. They had guidelines for development, uh, but uh, we wanted to find uh, um, scenarios uh, based on those guidelines. So for each scenario, we had to uh, uh, define a set of indicators, run an analysis according to the indicators, and create a regional suitability index. I will go into detail further on. Uh, for each scenario, we had to evaluate the feasibility according to the urban policy. So we had to study the existing uh, urban policy. Uh, also to uh, uh, evaluate uh, uh, the feasibility according to uh, particular investments in uh, specific places. Uh, we worked on uh, the region of uh, uh, Piemonte. So we worked first at the regional scale, then at the municipal scale. So the, key, the case study is basically this region, which is developed, uh, the subdivided in, in, uh, 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 in this set of sub-regions and in this much amount of municipalities. These are uh, uh, a thousand, close to a thousand municipalities that uh, 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 they have in, the, in this region. 
So municipalities in it Italy are smaller than the, the municipalities in, in Portugal, but still larger than the, what we call freguesias. We defined several, several scenarios. The scenarios were based on uh, uh, the Italian uh, 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 policy, development policies. And I'm going to show the only thing that we actually developed in this work. The work is unfinished. And is unfinished because we are still negotiating with, uh, 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 with coffee industry for further de developments. Uh, so what we did was basically a kind of a mock-up of what we could do uh, so that they could build some uh, 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 confidence on, on the work that we were showing. So we basically, we developed the first scenario, the, the startup scenario. And the idea was to find out where are the best places to invest for cre creation of new startups uh, in, uh, in this area. And so we had to do a lot of research, uh, research on uh, demographic information, uh, find representations of the place, get, gather uh, a lot of data. Uh, it was important for us to get information uh, about uh, university, uh, uh, universities and research labs because they are related with the uh, origin of, uh, um, uh, uh, of startups. Also the position of cinemas and theaters because they're culturally related with these uh, uh, cultural activities um, and uh, a, a, a lot of subjects and we needed to find uh, um, indicators for this. So for the start startup scenario, we developed this literature review. And then we decided to do a kind of reverse engineering process. First, locate where are the existing uh, uh, startups. So we first located that, those. We defined the indicators. Uh, the, these indicators, uh, came out of a lot of work that we did on uh, uh, literature, uh, but then we basically uh, uh, condensed all that information into these uh, uh, indicators that we point here. And the, the indicators were specialized, uh, related with uh, uh, a connectivity through a 30 minute, uh, minute uh, uh, walk or 30 kilometer drive. Uh, and we would check two types of connect, uh, connectivity, so pro proximity to the, um, um, uh, to the activities that we were considering. So we used the buffer system. The buffer is essentially a, 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 a radius taken from the building, uh, the, the, uh, the building of the municipality uh, and the idea of using this, uh, um, this as center is because the municipality is use, usually positioned in the most important uh, central place in each uh, municipality. Um, and basically, we count elements uh, for each uh, um, indicator within this buffer uh, zone. Uh, we also developed this idea using uh, the, the, um, the network distance, but it would become uh, computationally too heavy. So we basically stood with, uh, with the buffer uh, analysis and used just the, uh, the buffer analysis. Uh, so we calculated uh, all the buffers, calculated all the indicators, and, and then we did some uh, benchmark and, and correlation of, of the indicators. The benchmark was basically to do a scoring of, uh, uh, of these, uh, um, uh, of these um, yeah, indicators. So this is basically the criteria that we used for, uh, for scoring. Um, this is just an example. And we calculated the full index by summing all uh, uh, the scores that we got for, uh, from uh, the indicators. Um, then, using the correlation, and the correlation is essentially a, 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 a Pearson's correlation coefficient, uh, 
we multiplied the, 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 um, the values of, uh, uh, first we selected the most important uh, um, uh, indicators. We didn't use all the indicators, only the, the ones that uh, had a certain value, uh, so above a certain uh, value. And then we multiplied the value by uh, the, uh, the, the value that we got from the correlation. So it's, we call this uh, uh, an adjusted index, so the, the, or a weighted index that was uh, 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 calculated. Then we map this information. This is the mapping of the full index, and this is the adjusted uh, index. And then we did the same at the local scale, and this is just the province of uh, uh, Torino. Again, the full index. And Butillera is this area here. Uh, and this is the adjusted index. So the idea would be to run all the scenarios, get the same uh, calculations. And then, at this point, we get a total ranking of scenarios per municipality at region scale. We get the deviation of each municipality for each scenario uh, um, and uh, um, the deviation from its best suitability index. So we know how distant each scenario is from the best one. And now we can simulate changes. And changes that can uh, affect each of the indicators and check how much effort is uh, taken to reach the, the, the best ranking for each scenario. So in this way, we could evaluate which would be, let's say, the most reasonable investment to be done in each area. Uh, the important thing here is to understand that uh, the, although we didn't finish everything, so I don't have conclusions to show you, but uh, we are actually applying that with uh, uh, Daniel Cardoso to, uh, in, um, in a case in um, uh, Fortaleza. Uh, uh, it's, uh, we're using this, the same uh, methodology. Um, but uh, the important thing here is that it's a way of using uh, uh, existing information about activities and to find, uh, um, let's say, a, a way to measure the effort uh, uh, to do certain types of uh, 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 um, interventions that are taken as scenarios. So using a parametric tool as a simulation device, uh, we can calculate in real time the uh, urban indicators and check how much they improve and then compare it with the, the, the best values that we, uh, we get from the best examples and check the effort we, we can take. Or if, first, if we can reach that best uh, value, sometimes it's simply unreachable. In other uh, situations, we have actually, uh, uh, let's say, an effort uh, that can be measured. So this was the team that uh, developed the work. There's still a lot of work to develop to finish the work, as I said. But the interesting thing that we, uh, I think that was the most important part on, on this work is the achievement in terms of the methodology. And of course, we want to apply it furthermore. There's this example on Fortaleza. And I showed this presentation uh, at Penn State University one month ago. And they're also interested in applying that in state college in the United States. So uh, hopefully we will test this furthermore. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, ten. Ten, okay. So uh, the next pre uh, example is on um, the automated classification of urban typologies. Uh, this is... Uh, published on, on the paper that is referenced in this slide. And it's actually one of the papers that uh, has had more 
has been more referenced by uh, people. And basically, what we wanted to develop a, a kind of uh, urban morphology uh, method that was uh, based on, um, um, uh, on a semi-automated procedure. And we used two uh, neighborhoods in Lisbon, Muscovid and uh, the Expo uh, area from 98, uh, the north area, actually. Uh, and we calculated, um, uh, we wanted to classify two things, urban blocks and streets. So we calculated a set of uh, uh, measures uh, that we could take from the geometry. Um, and these are the attributes that we calculated. These are both for block and street. These are just exclusive of uh, uh, block. And these are attributes that were calculated uh, uh, from street. Um, these are all the, the, the codes that uh, we used to mark them. So basically, we did a lot of maps of, uh, uh, of, these, uh, um, of these attributes. And the set of mappings is uh, things like this in the amount of the attributes that we have. So if you look at the, the mappings, they basically, uh, when you look at, at them simultaneously, they, they don't tell you much. It's very difficult to analyze this visually. So we use an automated procedure. Uh, procedure. Uh, uh, basically, we, we stored every, every uh, attribute uh, in a database. Uh, we tried to find uh, um, correlations on uh, uh, the attributes, both at block and, and, uh, uh, and, and street level. And what I'm going to show you now is essentially on the block level. And we used a, um, um, a clustering procedure using the k-means algorithm. And we calculated six clusters for the blocks and four clusters for uh, uh, streets to do the classification. And after doing this uh, uh, classification, um, we got all the, 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 the measures of, uh, uh, of each of the attributes. But we tried also to look at each cluster and, and find a, a kind of a verbal description of what could be an intelligible uh, uh, expression of uh, uh, what uh, each block was. So in the, it, through this procedure, we were able to identify uh, different uh, morphological types. We can see, for instance, focusing on the blocks that block one corresponds to a closed uh, block, the peripheral traditional block with medium density in the private courtyard, while the blocks, uh, uh, block six is large, low density block with equipment and associated public space. And if we come here, we will see that block cluster one corresponds to these, and we find them only in the Mus Muscovid area, while the other one, which corresponds to this one, and this, we find it only in the Expo area. And all the others are intermediate expressions, but we could describe them quite precisely in a single sentence. And the automated procedure was uh, obviously capable of, uh, uh, of uh, highlighting these situations. Of course, after doing the clustering, we had values for each of these, uh, uh, each of these attributes. The interesting thing about having the values of the attributes is because we wanted to uh, uh, use these values to do uh, what we call generative patterns. So use the values to generate new patterns of the same kind using uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the values that we got. And we had a, a maximum and, and mi mi uh, minimum value for each of uh, uh, of the attributes, so it was very easy to uh, define the limits of each uh, uh, 
uh, of each cluster, of each type that uh, we found. Then we also did some analysis to find out uh, what were the occurrences of uh, each of the blocks in, uh, uh, in the two areas to try to understand the, the, let's say, the character of each of the neighborhoods um, and through the, uh, the presence of the different types of blocks in uh, the two neighborhoods, we uh, would get different uh, results. So the methodology allows to identify urban uh, morpho uh, morphological types uh, by searching for similarities uh, uh, within the data. So clusters correspond to typological uh, uh, similarities. Similarities are given, uh, are given uh, um, based on um, morphological uh, par parameters. So it's a, 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 an urban morphology uh, methodology. And the results can provide ranges uh, uh, for um, uh, defining uh, typical values of, uh, um, of these types and to define actually what the archetype is. And recently, we applied a similar, uh, um, uh, a similar method. I'm just going to show two images of this work. Uh, we've extended a, a bit further the, the methodology to compare two cities. Uh, and this was uh, developed by one of my uh, PhD students, uh, Olga uh, Tikhonova. She's, uh, uh, she's developing her PhD in, uh, in Lisbon. And she wanted to compare the two cities. She had at the beginning the idea that there were uh, some similarities between the cities of Lviv and Elvish, uh, which are extremely far away from each other. And because she found out that there were some aspects of, of their development that had some parallel, um, but then the conclusions actually uh, gives, uh, give us an idea that morphologically they are actually different. Um, essentially, there are not many uh, 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 similarities. Anyway, the difference in the methodology that we used here is that we did first a classification uh, also using uh, clustering. We did first a classification of the buildings, then used the uh, building clusters also as uh, building types to uh, embed in the clustering of uh, uh, the, the urban blocks. So the blocks actually contain the information of the building clusters. Um, and basically what we find is that the, 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 the types that we find, there are a few similarities, but basically we find types which are totally different uh, in uh, the, 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 two, uh, the two areas. And the same happens actually with the buildings. So I, I would say that all the buildings were already influencing the results of the clustering of, uh, of the urban blocks. And finally, this will be the f last um, example. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a, a work that we developed recently, uh, which is a, um, it's basically a model for the analysis of public space. And uh, it all started with uh, a, a criticism to uh, the, the representation of, of public space, uh, especially the space syntax uh, uh, representation doesn't include three-dimensional information. Uh, it loses uh, some of the information that we also find in the GIS uh, environment. So we wanted to connect all these things, introduce uh, topography and, uh, uh, and other aspects. But basically, the idea is to develop something that can be focused on the urban void. And also take in consideration the information about the surroundings of the public space, so the, the heights of buildings and uh, these kind of things. Another thing that we wanted is that the, these models would be able to perform field analysis, network analysis, and object-based analysis. So the three types of possible uh, analysis. Uh, so there were several questions. How to model 
uh, 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 spaces, uh, uh, a representation system that would be able to uh, uh, do these three types of uh, analysis uh, that could support multiple dimensions, that would be uh, uh, suitable for various urban settings and structures, could be automated, uh, could be manually uh, adjustable, uh, extended, uh, dependent uh, on, on, on scale and the scope of, of the analysis, could be using uh, 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 regular platforms, and especially the open source platforms that we're working on. And so the main idea, I'm going to skip this, the main idea was to find something that uh, could uh, uh, develop, start from the, 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 the idea of convex space, but already the generation of convex spaces was a problem. One of the things that we found, and it's usually given as a criticism to the space syntax representation, is that when you have a regular grid in the crossroads, uh, there's always one street, which is usually the largest street, which is, makes the, 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 the fattest uh, um, uh, convex space, and then the others are uh, 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 divided in, in, in parts. And we actually lose the information about the continuity of the streets that cross the main streets. Uh, so on one, one hand, it is capable of uh, capturing which are the main streets, but we lose the information about the secondary ones. So we wanted actually to, uh, the model to be able to uh, uh, keep that information, what the crossroad is and, and things like that. Uh, we wanted to, we started the work using a, a, a large model, but the computational time was uh, giving a lot of problems. Uh, we had to wait a lot, so we developed a kind of a uh, um, let's say, um, hypothetical uh, environment uh, which contained all the, uh, the main theoretical problems that we needed to face. It contained the topography, walls dividing different levels, uh, closed places, which are private places, uh, buildings with courtyards, uh, obstacles in the middle of the public space but allow view through it, uh, covered public space like this, and we wanted to deal with all these types of limits, including the heights of the buildings. And then we wanted to design some kind of convex space. And we did, we first did it by hand what we thought would be a, let's say, correct representation uh, uh, of that space. But then, of course, we wanted to uh, uh, do it automatically. And we thought that we should start from the topographic points and uh, probably we should first do a triangulation because triangles are already uh, convex spaces and then by gathering certain amount of triangles with, in keeping the convexity we would find the uh, referred convex spaces. Um, we, we had to deal with basically different levels of abstraction. So we want to reach convex space, then there was a, a, lowest, a lower uh, uh, level of abstraction, triangle, edges, vertices, and then locations. So we would start from the locations in the GIS uh, uh, information, which would give us actually also topographic heights, and then uh, we would find out vertices, the vertices with defined edges, and so on. So basically, this is a sequence of so starting from the points. Uh, the second uh, 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 procedure of the second algorithm basically excludes the inner private areas. So that's what happens here. Then it uses the locations in the outside spaces, so the public spaces. It generates a triangulation using uh, uh, um, uh, a Delaunay uh, triangulation uh, algorithm. And 
the thing is that the locations actually distinguish the points above from a point below. And so this was a, a part uh, of an, algor uh, an algorithm that we needed to add to the, proce to the procedure to distinguish uh, coincident points, uh, uh, but with different uh, uh, elevation. And then the idea was to uh, merge a lot of these uh, uh, triangles into the um, into a um, uh, into a more simplified representation. So we had to select some the, the important vertices on the limits of the representation, especially due to these situations where you have an obstacle like a, a lake or a pool or fountain that allows view but doesn't allow passing. Another thing was to define how to capture the height of the building and to use the influence of the height of the building. Um, so this is used as a projection of the facade into uh, uh, the, the public space, which in some cases generates new vertices, which are important for the calculations. And then the, uh, the new alg this algorithm generates the, the, the a new triangulation and, and, and a new um, merge of, of the triangles into convex spaces. Then the, we had a problem with the, uh, developing the algorithm to, uh, to do the, convex, uh, 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 the convexity of um, uh, uh, the merging of, of the triangles. Uh, the situation we have in, in the space syntax uh, um, uh, uh, theory is that we find, try to find, as a level of superior, superiority, the fattest space. And the definition of the fattest space generates a type of representation, but we found that we could use other types of, uh, uh, of superior, superiority levels uh, to... Um, to define uh, the aggregation of triangles. One of the things, one of the other possibilities, so fatness would give us this representation where we still have uh, the, the street without representation of the, 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 the crossings. So we wanted to have this more this type of approach. So we used also compactness and this situation of using fatness and compactness would produce this situation, and squareness would produce something very close to what we wanted. Actually, in the final, the, the, the algorithms that we have have this as options. So it is possible to generate all these types of representations, depending on the type of model that uh, we need for the analysis. So we basically, wanted, we wanted to test uh, uh, this, if this could re represent the, um, uh, could uh, allow the different types of analysis, so the, the field analysis, the network analysis, and the object-based analysis. And the first thing we did was already, um, uh, so at this point, we had a convex space representation which has convex spaces, but they are tilted with information of, uh, 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 regarding the, the topography. They have information about all the previous levels, so each uh, convex space contains information about which triangles they, uh, are, they uh, are built of, which edges each triangle is built of, uh, uh, and, uh, and so on, which vertices and the heights of the vertices and also the information about the boundary uh, the area, so the heights of buildings, of the facades, et cetera. So all this information plus GIS information is also added to the model. Everything is contained uh, in the model. That's why we called it 3D 
informed convex spaces. And then we also wanted to generate three-dimensional representations of this, so we, we also use uh, an algorithm which has, again, five options to generate the uh, three-dimensional representation of the, the space, the simplest of which it, it is taking the average of the heights of the surrounding buildings. There are other, other options. And then we also did, based on uh, uh, connectivity of the, uh, and we call these 3D representations, we call them convex voids. And then by aggregating the convex voids according to uh, um, uh, linear uh, 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 continuity, uh, based on a, a, a maximum ang angular deviation, we did the aggregations of these and we call them uh, solid voids. So basically, we did these types of uh, uh, representations. The solid voids actually generate a new type of network. We have continuities of space, and they cross each other. So we can talk about connectivity, uh, continuity, uh, and we have a lot of uh, typical prop properties that we find in network analysis. Then we use this uh, in uh, uh, an area in Lisbon. The area is very small, so some of the analyses are, let's say, meaningless in terms of the information that you might extract out of it, but it just proves that it is possible to perform these types of analyses. The, the reason why we did that was to save time because it's computationally heavy. Uh, so these are uh, sky view factors mapped in three different ways. Uh, this is the calculation of space integration using uh, the, the uh, space, uh, uh, the definition of space integration by space syntax, space control, space betweenness. So to, to make these, let's say, these uh, uh, representations. Uh, uh, meaningful, we had to add a larger buffer area to analyze this smaller area. And then object-based analysis, so space squareness and space fatness. And so the model provides this uh, uh, response to all the questions that we had. It can uh, uh, do these three types of analysis. It supports 2D and 3D representations. Uh, uh, it's suitable uh, for, uh, I would say, neighborhood scale, uh, uh, essentially. Uh, it can be automated and calibrated. Uh, so it's manually adjustable in the, fact, in the sense that it is calibratable. Um, and um, it can be uh, uh, adapted for different types of uh, uh, analysis. And it supports uh, uh, Python uh, classes and shape files. And as future work, we need to, the most important thing is we need to, to try to simplify the, the, the algorithms to make, make them lighter. That's the most important thing. Uh, but um, we uh, essentially need to do more work using more case studies. We, we have a student uh, who's working, she, she's Turkish, so she, she's using Istanbul and Lisbon to, uh, uh, to work on, on, on this uh, level. And we're trying to uh, uh, correlate these results also with space syntax uh, uh, results and, and Essentially, the idea is to further validate the models as analytical uh, models. Um, so improving the computation time, it's very important. And again, what we also want to do is to make it more user-friendly. Uh, uh, so we're trying to improve a little bit the interface of this. Um, <coughs> This presentation originally was done when we finished the work, so there were still a lot of debugging process going on. Most of the debugging process is uh, essentially done, um, but uh, 
the most important thing now is to develop theory, uh, more theory based on, on this type of uh, um, representation models. And I will stay through this. Uh, just keep in mind that there was something about streets on this presentation, but it's available on this paper. Okay. And it's, again, about new tools uh, uh, to analyze uh, streets. So thank you for the presentations. <laughs> I really enjoyed both, but my question is really for Nuno Beirão. Um, I have the two questions. Um, may, maybe you, you, you say that, but are you, are you thinking in the future to linking this uh, 3D format convex space, this software with KGIS, or? It's already linked. It's already linked? It's alre uh, actually, the, the convex space generation mm -hmm. is, um, uh, is developed uh, on, um, uh, on GIS. On QGIS. But is it a plugin already? It is a plugin for QGIS. What is the name? Is this name? Uh, we're not sharing it uh, oh, it's okay. <laughs> yet because we, there are a few things that we still need to do. We, we, we want to, to, to make it faster and, uh, and it's dependent on uh, uh, triangulation algorithms. So the uh, installation is a little bit cumbersome. Uh, we found out that depending on the type of uh, 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 operational system that you have, you might have different types of, uh, of problems. So, uh, what we're planning to do is to uh, uh, put everything in a server and then share that uh, software in, in, in the server. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, uh, so that it, it isn't dependent on each person's uh, 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 computer and on installing more extra uh, uh, stuff. So the extra stuff will be all loaded into, into the system. Um, th that's the reason why it's, it, it's not done. Uh, for instance, uh, w w uh, <coughs> among our, our group, when we were installing it, everyone had a different computer. And uh, in my case, I had to install uh, three more alg uh, algorithms than any other uh, of any of the other guys in the, in, in the group. Uh, but this is essentially things that should be already uh, installed uh, uh, in, um, in QGIS or available in uh, the Windows operation, operation system. Uh, I think it's compatible with uh, um, uh, with Mac users, we didn't find any problem with Mac users, uh, but there are also differences in terms of the installation, mm -hmm. again, dependent on the computer. So that's the reason why it's not shared that openly, yes. because uh, at a certain point, we, uh, we defined the, uh, a Google Doc with all the instructions for installation. And every time we find a problem, we added uh, uh, a new instruction. Now it has 12 pages. Uh, <laughs> so it becomes unmanageable. Uh, the idea is to make it uh, stable enough so that everyone can install it and there's no problem. So we will be waiting. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, if you want to work with it, we can do Good. the installation Excellent. for you. That's no problem. Thank you. Thank you. So but I have a, another question, if, if I may. Um, the, the example from Italy, when you... I like special this, this phrase when you say that design and, and design an urban plan. Mm -hmm. And then you have a, call it in a small, but it's meta, meta design. Yep. So uh, what will be the, 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 the nature of, uh, it will be more a scenario that you can change. This is the most part more, more interesting, but how, how, how about the implementation? What, uh, how the local authorities could keep in working with this tool, <laughs> uh, this scenario? Uh, this, is, this changed the nature of the planning itself, the plans, the, the meta plan that you, you yeah, call? Yeah, um, we, we didn't finish 
totally the part. Uh, we did one example for the workshop. On the workshop, we had a, 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 a grasshopper-based uh, simulation system and with the calculations, but it was very much prepared for the situation that we were showing in the workshop. It was a one-day workshop, so it's the kind of thing that we need to prepare everything very well, show how it works, and not exactly being developing the things with, with the people, because uh, if it's so uh, difficult to install just the software, because it's we're connecting a lot of software with a lot of algorithms that we develop for doing our, our uh, work, that uh, uh, it becomes impossible to, to do that in a single day workshop. Oh, yeah. the, o the only thing we can do is show. Um, uh, because it usually takes two or three days just for the installations. Uh, it's not because one installation <laughs> is not fast. One installation might be relatively fast if everything goes smoothly then someone has a problem which takes one hour to solve. And another one has a different problem which takes another hour to solve. And if we have 12 people attending the workshop with different problems, we have 12 hours. And it happens every time. So that's the reason why in a single day work workshop we prepare everything but we just show how it works. Um, anyway, the, uh, the idea uh, of the meta, uh, uh, what we call meta design, uh, is uh, something that provides a, 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 a growth in a particular area of a specific morphological type, which is related with the, the, the properties, the indicators that we want to calculate. Um, so it's very abstract. Uh, I would say it's something open for design in the way we understand design and especially in the way that Javier was talking about design. It's totally open. It's just a question of amount. Uh, so it's something that is measurable uh, and it should give some idea if we have different, this type of investment in this area and we change these indicators, then we uh, somehow try to approach the best value of what we calculated in other situations as the best performance. Uh, so it's trying to change a reality towards something that might be a best performance in a particular viewpoint. Again, it's still a meta design in the sense it's not a solution. It's uh, a way of capturing an idea of how much uh, uh, worth is to put an effort on that type of uh, scenario or not. If, it, if it's even reachable or not. Sometimes it's impossible to reach a certain scenario. We just see a very slight in, in improvement in, uh, uh, in the indicators, uh, while in other uh, uh, situations the improvement might be more expressive. So. It's just by comparing how much improvement you get on one scenario comparing with, with another that allows us to say, well, maybe it's better to invest in this scenario than on the other one. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, one first for Beto. Um, I had a chance to see some of the research you've been doing in your group. Uh, but now you've developed even further the idea of the convex voids and, and all the consequences of it. Do you think that it's coming up another kind of analysis that will combine linear, therefore, network analysis and the more local and specifically uh, related to convex spaces or void space within the city that will be able to combine both analysis in terms of local properties, global properties, and even further, combining certain elements of the surfaces and volumes that are, you know, uh, surrounding in, um, bringing, in, bringing in not only new ways of describing it, but uh, understanding exactly what you had just finished your your presentation uh, related to liveliness and what we we do 
uh, enjoy in cities, which is liveliness. And just jumping to the next question for the first presentation, uh, some, of the, um, some of the elements and uh, types and subtypes and properties and sub -pro some pr uh, sorry, principles and sub-principles that you've presented, some of them are very difficult to be described uh, in terms of universal um, understanding. Uh, some of them are extremely, I would say, personal, even though some of them are really universal and could be described mathematically. Uh, for example, harmony. If you define what you understand by harmony and the relationship between the parts of the, of the constituent elements, you would be able to find harmony. But some of them are not. Uh, this is not a criticism. It's just uh, an idea or uh, just how could we follow uh, that kind of knowledge which is um, following the sense of uh, generating uh, interface between different ways of learning the environment as you, you proposed. How can you combine them to create something even stronger as uh, you've just proposed? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, the convex uh, and, and, and solid void models are very suitable for uh, what I call neighborhood analysis and even lower scale uh, street analysis, uh, small area uh, analysis. Uh, it doesn't make sense for the scale of the city um, for many reasons. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, there are a lot of developments that can be made uh, regarding the study of the, the public space. Um, Elif is working, for, for instance, Elif is working on, on, on the, the, the uh, walkability analysis. And for the walkability, we're talking about human scale and areas that uh, you can walk. Um, so uh, it makes sense to use this information because it already contains information about uh, uh, many aspects of, uh, of the uh, environment in terms of how the environment surrounds you. And uh, one thing that we've been discussing is how can we uh, find models where we have, for instance, uh, information about entrances many times is not, are not available. Uh, but still we've been able to work with entrances. Work, entrances are very important, but even windows are important to, for this uh, level of scale. Uh, and it's almost impossible to find models with this information. But uh, one of the things that uh, we find, we, we actually were interested is to find a kind of automated procedure to uh, locate the windows in the model. Alif already did some stuff on that, uh, on that level. Uh, using uh, uh, Google, um, uh, Google models and, and, and then bringing that information into, uh, into the model. But it's not 100% reliable, so yeah. But of course, at this scale, I, I think that's what makes sense, it, it's to work at, at this lower level scale, and I think there, there is theory to be developed at this level. Voy a contestar en español y, y con la amabilidad de, de David me traduce también por mi dificultad de inglés pero también por precisar en español más los conceptos. Eh, el tema es muy de fondo. Yo soy profesor de teoría y entonces tenemos eh, el afán de ir a cuestiones de fondo, de contenido. Actually, it's, it's the Brazilian, you would understand you, but I will explain to the, <laughs> to the rest of the... Uh, uh, he's saying that he's a professor of theory, that he approached these kind of issues in a, in a foundation perspective. He, he, he likes to, to, to go deep in these concepts and uh, then work from them. Eh, vamos un poco a intentar ir al fondo, o a cierto fondo. El problema de la forma urbana eh, es un problema de civilización. Uh, 
de organización colectiva, organización del espacio, lo decía Fernando Tábora. Eh, tenemos un gran problema, a mi juicio, de civilización. Paul Ricoeur, eh, me gusta mucho el análisis que hace, el gran filósofo francés en historia y verdad. Uh, he's saying that the, the urban form is an issue with, uh, in his opinion, right now, with, uh, with this kind of uh, um, with, with, the, with the main framework that is set on a civilizational um, uh, issue that he wants to approach uh, in this uh, perspective. He's, he's quoting some reference. Sí. Paul Ricoeur. Eh distingue, creo que es muy importante esto eh, afirma que, que la civilización, y lo podemos aplicar a, a la ciudad, la civilización tiene un altísimo desarrollo tecnológico, eh, científico racional pero al mismo tiempo eh, un, un gran aumento de lo absurdo en definitiva de la falta de sentido Um, used to ha has a big technological development, but uh, alongside with it, um, a kind of um, um, absurd um, uh, framework regarding the, the technological development that is uh, alongside with it. Entonces, por, por, no, eh, por no alargarme, eh, desde el punto de vista ontológico, lo, lo racional, lo analítico, es una parte de, eh, de la comprensión global del, del ser humano, solo una parte. Es decir, eh, son los límites del pensamiento científico. Es poniendo estos issues on a ontological level um, as a kind of a boundary for the scientific knowledge. Por resumir y ir a la cuestión de, de la forma urbana. Y aquí eh, hablamos ya no de Ricoeur, sino de Álvaro Alto, reflexiones de Álvaro Alto, de Fernando Tábora, que, que contemplaban los problemas de, de la organización del espacio con, desde una perspectiva humanística. Eh, la cuestión es... Eh, la falta de sentido es porque la racionalidad no agota la comprensión de lo humano, de la persona humana. He's saying that the rationality is not enough to uh, put uh, in the equation to frame all the issues regarding the comprehension of the human condition, the human lovability, etc. Entonces, cuando contestando a la pregunta, cuando Abordamos el tema de la forma urbana, de la forma arquitectónica. Hay que comprender, desde luego, la dimensión racional, la analítica, es muy válido, pero sobre todo la forma, como decía Fernando Tábora, es una cuestión de vivencia humana. La, la vivencia de los espacios, no solo desde el nivel psíquico, intelectual, sino funcional, etc. La vivencia integrada humana de los espacios. Uh, he's saying that the, the need to articulate uh, the analysis, the space analysis and the, the different instruments that we have to do that with uh, the way that we live those spaces and how people interact and appropriate and, and is um, sharing experience in, in, this, in, the, in those kind of spaces. Entonces, eh, conocemos poco eh, todavía al ser humano. Es decir, en Manuel Munier o incluso Paul Ricoeur hablan de la necesidad de un, de, de un eh, rehacer el, el humanismo del renacimiento. Es decir, debemos de profundizar en la comprensión del humano para comprender los problemas de la organización del espacio y de la forma. Entonces ya acabo. Um, para comprender eh, um, estas cuestiones, digamos, humanas de la forma, es lo que he dicho en 
en mi intervención, hay que volver a articular los aspectos cualitativos de la vivencia humana. No, no, lo humano no se agota en lo racional abstracto, sino en, eh, digamos, en la hermenéutica, en la comprensión de la, de la vivencia. Y entonces los principios son un camino interesante para acceder a esto. Are um, a way to um, try to give a wide perspective of the um, the qualitative terms that should be added, should be put alongside with the more analytical approach to uh, the space analysis and how this uh, quantitative and um, um, uh, more rational uh, approach to space analysis should be complemented with um, uh, human kind of human perspective of those places also, uh, accepting the ambiguity and the uh, abstract uh, conditions of uh, certain uh, principles that were presented. Es un juego dialéctico entre los principios y la comprobación en los casos concretos, históricos y contemporáneos. Es un proceso dialéctico de confirmación de los principios y de ampliación de los principios en sus principios, etc. Es decir, es un estudio empírico de principios y eh, casos. Casos. It's, it's a dialectic game between the principles and the study case that were uh, possible to be analyzed within this uh, um, way of uh, space analysis. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I, 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 I want to say a few words regarding this. I, I won't allow more questions because we are quite late. Sorry, we, we, we will have to do that on the, on the um, coffee break. If it is just a short one. It's but important. It's important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, um, okay, but just, just to let, 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 let to say this. I know the work of uh, Verão and the work of uh, Professor Javier, and they are here because I want this um, um, relation between the work of Verão and the work of Javier. Uh, regarding what was said today, uh, yesterday, in the beginning of the symposium, the, this difficult relation between creativity, quality, and uh, formalization or computation, whatever you want to call it, um, is something that is, uh, in a way, in, sometimes they are put in different contexts and the dialogue between these, those contents or contexts are not always uh, there. We are trying to put together these contexts and these contents that approach these kind of issues in different um, ways of doing it. So we, they are not here just by, they are here because we, we, really, we really want this to happen in this term for, for this confrontation, for this idea of the different perspectives of, that we can give to um, uh, formalization and uh, computation. Um, Franklin. I'm sorry, I think it's important. Yes. It's a practice of, uh, it's a practice of uh, our uh, symposiums Yes. We, we discuss, <laughs> we yeah. don't enable, we don't uh, prevent someone to, <laughs> to, to, put to, to, to put questions. Uh, well, when I was hearing Professor Poyatos, I thought I was, I has gone back to the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century in uh, Kemalake is the siege of uh, Bozar one of the most famous architectural schools, and I was hearing some uh, class from uh, the treat, uh, treatise of, uh, of uh, Gauzin or someone of uh, those old uh, uh, architectural treatise. Uh, well, as we know, uh, that kind of uh, uh, books uh, and uh, principles uh, are no longer uh, installed in uh, architectural practice uh, nowadays. Uh, in, the, in the same time, uh, Are Metier, uh, Arts and Crafts and so on, and later uh, Vukutemas and Bauhaus destroyed uh, those kind of, uh, that kind of speech. <coughs> well, uh, I think uh, 
uh, wrongly because uh, some time later, with uh, the development of speech theory and uh, semiology and uh, structuralism, they uh, recuperate, they uh, have gone to, well, that's, that is the, the general discussion about rhetorics. Uh, not only in architecture, but all, uh, in all the art. It's uh, the old question, since Aristotle and uh, Plato, uh, that question, that uh, debate on rhetorics. And they, uh, well, structuralism and uh, semiology and so on, and the speech uh, theory, um, they have recuperated uh, rhetorics, uh, but liberating uh, rhetorics from uh, some bad things that uh, the academy, the academism of Bozar, uh, uh, but they recovered what was really good. Well, um, and uh, well, uh, that analysis is, uh, find that, for example, modernism, Bozar and so on, for example, Venturi said that, that uh, the anti-rhetoric uh, speech was, uh, in fact, they were, they were, modernism was, in fact, masters of, of rhetoric. Venturi said that uh, those are made monuments to something, and uh, modernism made uh, monuments to, uh, to itself, to, <laughs> to, to themselves. <clears throat> the use of rhetorics, uh, even in uh, anti-rhetoric speech, is, uh, uh, patent in uh, in the works of uh, of, the, of modernism, but that discussion of uh, on rhetorics uh, brought back many of the of the principles uh, of uh, old schools, and I think they liberated the rhetorics from two. Uh, two issues, uh, two that were uh, very wrong. First, it was uh, rhetorics was uh, understood as uh, uh, a linguistic linguistic tropes for uh, normalizing beauty, uh, and that was put apart. That was uh, forgotten because those uh, tropes, those uh, shape definitions, uh, were uh, completely out of date, and uh, they could not. Uh, we are not uh, constructing uh, uh, buildings with, uh, with uh, Greek uh, columns. Uh, no more. <clears throat> yes, but in the 19th century, and even in the 20th century, in the, in the, in the first years of the 20th century, we had uh, those kind of, uh, of things. Uh, and the second is what uh, Louise referred is the, well, linguistic approach, and it's what we are doing now. It's to try to formalize those, uh, those concepts. We recovered the concepts, but we destroyed the norm. We don't, it, uh, it, we don't, know, we don't want norms, but we want concepts. <laughs> and when I was seeing what the Professor uh, Poyatus was lining there, I began to think, well, I would like to formalize everything <laughs> is there. It's very, very good. Those concepts are very, very good to formalize. And some of them are already formalized. For example, he talked about, uh, well, perceptual clearness. In space syntax, for example, it's completely normalized in concepts like intelligibility, entropy, or controllability. Well, and the others, I was, I was looking there, I thought, yes, it's that I want to, <laughs> to, to study. Uh, they were completely uh, subjective and, uh, uh, well, very fluid. And now we want to formalize those concepts. Maybe some of them uh, will be sent to the to the to garbage, uh, but many of them will be uh, recovered. <laughs> well, this is the. the can, first... can I just confuse you very fast? <laughs> uh, well, just uh, two sentences. Uh, first, I completely agree with the principles that uh, Javier has exposed. So, every single of them. I think they're all great. Second aspect, I think the problems we face nowadays are not exactly a clash between technology and the principles of excellence in, in, in design. It's actually a political problem. 
it's the advent of democracy over totalitarianism. Uh, what was allowed people to design cities in, with all these principles was the totalitarian regimes. Nowadays, if we accept that democracy is better than any totalitarian regime, it means that we have to accept that mediocrity is part of it. It's a political problem. Well, uh, well this open debate for the rest two hours. <laughs> okay. So we will have lunch at four o'clock in the. I, I'm going back to. Because I, I would have to say about one hour. <laughs> I, I'm going back to architects because I don't want to. In the coffee break, I will. I think it's better not to. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Second uh, question on uh, architectural problems. I think the construction or built environment is one of the major uh, human activities. For example, it deals with 60% of all the natural resources of the planet. <laughs> it's one of the biggest uh, makers of uh, change in the, in the environment. <laughs> well, and uh, that means that architect, architects have uh, very, uh, great responsibilities in all this. Well, if uh, architects only want to deal with communication, it will be very wrong. Because there are, well, in my terms, three main tiers of this participation. One is the material configuration of the world. Because this wall does not communicate to me that I cannot go to there. It physically. <laughs> makes that I have to go to the door to pass to the other way. And this is a very uh, simple way to do because uh, this material configuration is not, uh, not in those uh, little examples. It's generally configurates, the cities configurates the human activities. So configurates uh, uh, society. It's very big and uh, I think uh, well, as uh, uh, Bayron uh, just demonstrated, it's a very, very uh, large uh, field of operation for architects. Well, first. Second is construction, because construction is how we do, and the movement is important, not, on, not only the goal, but how we reach there. The built environment is constructed, and this movement to construct is very important too. To, uh, to all human activities, and third, communication. And I said it in what I think is the degree of importance of them. If uh, architects, and there is a great movement that says the architect is art, is uh, communication, but it is not. If the architect abandons uh, material configuration to society or to market, it's uh, <laughs> the, the word that uh, well, uh, now we have society to market. Uh, the second is abandoned construction, abandoned to engineers, and uh, uh, architects remain with communication. It would be very, very, very wrong, I, I would say. Uh, OK, sir, this is a question of rationality. Well, I think we all agree that uh, human, act, human uh, behavior is not rational. Completely rational. It's one a part of uh, human uh, behavior. But there is a science, a whole science, that uh, is trying to understand rationality, how the humans behave, and rationality is psychology. <laughs> what I mean is that if we have a, a human behavior not rational, that does not mean that it is not rational, rationalizable. Well, you can understand the not rational understanding, uh, the not rational behavior with a rational understanding. It's science. There is no opposition. Human behavior is rational and not rational. Understanding of human behavior is rational. <laughs> and that means that we don't have, in concrete and going to the, to the beginning, is we don't 
need to give uh, to give rational uh, norms to beauty. We have to understand the cities, how they develop, uh, and not to say that uh, size or scale is good or bad. I, uh, and to finish, uh, Greek is human scale. Egyptian pyramids are, uh, well, uh, very bad uh, scale, not human. Well, that is completely wrong. They, we have to understand how, be, why Egyptian civilization needs pyramids and why Greek civilization needs human, uh, human scale. And uh, there is no good or evil there. <coughs> and uh, I said, <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, we go to coffee break now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for uh, being here. Thank you both. Uh, this was a, a wonderful discussion. We had a lot of to discuss here, but, but we have a schedule to try to keep because we are really out of schedule.